Let's now look at the underpinning mathematics that Einstein used to describe his special theory of relativity. After Michelson and Morley revealed their failed attempt to find the ether wind, many physicists, including Voldemar Voigt, George Fitzgerald, Joseph Larmer, and Hendrik Lorentz, were all researching what Maxwell's equations meant and how to accommodate the staggering null result. They all hunted for the transformation between two reference frames where Maxwell's equations were invariant, that is, where you didn't have to modify the form of the equations for any relative motions. They found what was called the Lorentz transformation, shown here, but their combined goal was to preserve the ether's existence. Einstein did his own derivation of the Lorentz transformation for his 1905 paper, starting from his two postulates and arriving at the same set of equations you see here, all without relying on an underlying assumption of the ether or even trying to preserve it. Before we follow his derivation, we need to basically understand what the Lorentz transformation is. First, let's go back to the definition of a relatively moving reference frame. Basically, you can think of them as a coordinate grid that's at rest with respect to a given observer. Each observer can think of their reference frame as a massive cubic grid of meter sticks, and at each intersection in the grid, a clock is fixed to the node. All the clocks in one observer's frame are set up to be in sync, and now, moving relative to that frame, another observer's frame has the exact same arrangement, but centered around him. These two frames are moving uniformly, that is with a constant speed and no changes in direction or acceleration, with respect to each other. We'll have to pretend that the two frames are made of some ghostly material that allows each other's frames to pass through with them. That's what the diagram on the top left actually means. So, one frame, we'll call it the primed frame, is moving along the unprimed frame's x-axis at a constant speed v. Relatively, the unprimed frame sees the prime frame moving to the right, and the prime sees unprime moving to the left. Our job is now to ask, given this setup and that we live in unprime, how do our measurements in unprime transform over to primes measurements? First, we look at the two equations in the green box at the top. Let's say our two events are the turning on of a light bulb and the detector receiving the light. In our home, unprimed frame, the distance the light travels is delta L squared. And that distance is, of course, just like the Pythagorean theorem, except for each coordinate, we have two locations in each dimension, one for the starting place of the light and the other for the detector. Naturally, that distance is equal to the square of the speed of light times the difference in time between emission and reception. This will also be true in prime land. Now, Einstein's postulate is that all observers see the same speed of light. So, C is the same for both equations. We don't put any requirements on any other measurements to be the same, however. Indeed, they can't all be the same. The frames are moving with respect to each other. Both of them lead to that intermediate equation with the delta x squared, delta y squared, delta z squared, minus c squared, delta t squared equals zero. They're all of the same form. We'll call that thing here equal to zero. That's in between the green and blue box the space-time interval. We usually denote that interval as delta s squared, as you see below. In our little example with the light bulbs, we see that the events connected by the speed of light are called null space-time intervals because they equal zero. Now, if we do a pair of events that are not connected by the speed of light, like the popping of a cork in unprime and the cork subsequent hitting the wall, what does the frame grid of meter sticks and clocks read in the relatively moving prime frame for these two events? Well, in the blue box, we have two different space-time intervals, each measured in their own frame. In the light bulb example, the space-time intervals were the same and equal to zero. Since this isn't a murder mystery, I'll say up front that the Lorentz transformation requires that these intervals are always the same for the same events measured in two different frames. This means delta s squared is the same as delta s prime squared for all frames. I'll justify and prove this later, but for now, let's take it as a necessary thing that the space-time intervals are invariant. Let's take a look. On the bottom left are Galileo's transformations. 
These transformations don't on the surface appear to be a good transformation given the co-mingling of space and time, but they seem to work in everyday life, so they can't be 100% wrong. But if you look at events where you're transforming between two frames at a speed that's an appreciable fraction of the speed of light, then you need the middle set of equations. These are the Lorentz transformations. With this, we now get some odd things. For the x coordinate, which is the direction of motion, x prime does not just depend upon the speed of the relative motion and the event's subsequent position in un prime, but it also now depends on the time measurement in un prime. That's wacky. Even wackier, the time is no longer universally the same. t prime does not equal t un prime. Transforming un prime time to prime time depends not just on their relative motion, but also on the unprime x position. Again, transforming to a time coordinate in prime in the prime coordinate system depends both on the unprime time and the position in unprime. Time and space are interlinked. It means they're really one and the same thing-ish. They're both parts of some broader thing called spacetime. And that gamma, that's what's called the Lorentz factor, and it's a needed coefficient to the transformation equations. It's an interesting thing, because starting with v being the relative speed between the two frames and c being the speed of light, if v is really small with respect to the speed of light, then the Lorentz transformations are very well approximated by the Galilean transformations. But we also see that as v approaches c, gamma approaches infinity faster and faster. This has strange implications, as we'll see later. Just to reiterate, we got the Lorentz transformations because we assumed two things, Einstein's second postulate and the invariance of the space-time interval. Again, what motivates that second one? The space-time interval is now the thing that is measured in a given inertial reference frame. All the laws of physics and mechanics are the same, which would include the nature of the measurements of distance and time. So the space-time interval invariance is like saying clocks work the same in both frames and meter sticks are the same things and do the same thing in both frames. This Lorentz transformation is central to special relativity. And notice it doesn't ask us to show an absolute space or time. It only shows us how to go between two moving frames, whether very fast or very slow. And the nature of these moving frames coordinates show that each frame measures their own time and their own distance, and each is at rest in their own frame, and each looks exactly as you would expect them to look. It's just like if you were in some room with clocks and meter sticks doing an assignment for a physics class. The same would be true of the moving frame. But when you're chatting with each other about the events you both measure in different frames, you get different results. Okay, now let's see where this transformation comes from.